You know, I'll say this, and somehow the Gideons, uh, they look over this part here. There wouldn't be any spoken word of God if it wasn't for the written. Okay. It has to be written for me to read it. And I have to read it before I can understand it. And if it ain't here, I can't read it. So, the written word of God has to be learned before you can speak the word of God. And if you're not, if you're one of these people that just reads it so you can straighten the rest of the world out, okay, you're reading it on the wrong side of your Bible. Amen. You read it on the wrong side of the cross. Because it's not to straighten everybody else out. It's for me. That's who it's for. Boy, I tell you what, I gotta get here. This one here. I can't remember what time of night I did get this one last night. So I went to bed, I didn't have it. <laughs> Susie's or Carol's, either one, Carol's your guardian. What I'm saying is, 
when you fail to do it, you fail that person badly. Very bad. And I'm not doing it to make you feel bad for doing it. I'm just hoping that through this, and me saying this, that maybe it'll give you desire the next time that somebody goes into the nursing home or hospital, that you'll be willing to go see them. And I was sitting there at the house this morning, and they're down in my study this morning, and I was thinking about this and thinking about it pretty much. Emma, stand up. Yeah, your name's Emma, ain't it? There's one person that, in the church that frequently goes to the nursing home and the hospitals to see people, and that's Emma. Share it, you know, or I know where Emma. And, you know, she don't get a pat on the back for it. She don't have to have recognition for it. I'm recognizing her this morning because she goes. And she goes to visit the sick. When uh, Mary Ann was in, in uh, uh, the springs over there, she went to see her. And if he was in the springs, she probably went to see you. David goes, she, she goes to the nursing home and visits, you know. And I, you can sit down, you don't stand all day. And, but I just want you to know that there are some that it has a heart that they want to go see people when they're in the nursing home. And somebody said, well, you do a lot, you go all of you go and pray and go and sing. And that's, what I, that's what I do. That's, that's, that I realize that, that if somebody don't go, those people aren't going to have anybody because their family's not home. And see, some of them have dementia and don't even know whether their families want to see them or not. But I'll tell you what, God knows whether somebody's going to see him or not. Amen. That's why he gives us a heart. That's why if we see people like that and it, it bothers us and, and uh, we go and we, we, we have prayer with them and we hug them and we love them and let them know that God loves them. That's why we go. That's why I go. And I'm not, please don't think that I'm, I'm scolding or putting down. I'm just trying to remind you that maybe one day you'll be the same way. And I'm going to tell you something else, too. Uh, hey, one time that I ever went to a nursing home or to a house and visited a sick person that I didn't enjoy it. It didn't leave her to feel like I was blessed. And I believe they did, too. Amen. I believe they really felt. I believe Mr. Withers, the mom, was glad that the time I went to see her. may not have been that much, but I was there. And it meant something to her. You know, you're the only Jesus that they're going to see. Take the cross with you when you go and you'll have a birth for it. Okay? Philippians chapter 3. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, again, I come to you this morning. Lord, thank you so much for this hour. Lord, it's a, a privilege every time we get to stand here under the anointing that you've called us to preach under. And Father, we ask you now that you take this anointing that's on me right now, use it for your glory. Let me do everything to promote the kingdom in order to build the wisdom of grace inside your people. For in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. How many of you were here, I believe it was last, no, last Sunday, wasn't it, when uh, Shirley Pelfrey in the land down on the floor, how many was here? Anyway, I want to get down with you for a moment, but like I always do. But she came up for prayer, and I'll tell you what she came up for. She said, Danny, she said, I just can't feel the Lord anymore. I can feel it. I said, you will. You will. And I prayed for her. I called Tom to stand behind her. I knew that if she felt the Lord and the power of the Lord, she was going down. I knew that. I called Tom up. Tom came up. I said, just stand behind her. Catch her. Don't let her fall to the floor back on that bench. And I prayed for her, and I took my hands off of her. I was not touching her at all. I backed away, and I said, you're going to feel the power of the Lord. And when I took my hands off of her, I took my turn. I could feel the power as it was leaving me from one of her. I just walked away from her and she fell back into Tom's arms, laid on the floor. Feeling the 
power of God. Honey, it's real. The Pentecostal blessing is something that is real, but it's something you don't toy with and play with because it comes by the cross of Calvary. It's not something that you can just call in and usher in any time you want to. That kind comes with prayer and fasting like the Bible says it does. You take the time to seek the Spirit so that you can deliver the Spirit to somebody else. You can't pray the Spirit on somebody else if you're not seeking the Spirit your own self. I have to seek it for you in order for you to get it. Amen? People don't understand. They think they can go for a person to do this and automatically they've got the Spirit all over. Somebody needs to seek with you and for you when you come up here. That's the reason you come up. Just so you can have some help. Amen? Amen, there, aren't you? <laughs> These Gideons, buddy, they're open to the gospel. Now, I want to start reading around uh, verse 14. Like I say, I'm going to I'm going to take my time here, but this is this is all in response to the cross, the cross of Calvary. I don't care what your ministry is, if it is not in touch with the cross, it's false doctrine. You're a false witness. It has to be with the cross. It is the gospel, it is the power of God and the salvation. And it's from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 to build up for the cross. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I press on, amen, in the high calling of God. Now, my, my note I put down here is the moral and spiritual target. When you press on for the mark, read that again now. Press on toward the mark for the prize of the high calling, talking about the moral and the spiritual target. That means on both sides of it. You're living morally for the spiritual target. And if you're not living with the morals in your life and the good morals, then the target's out of reach for you. Amen? That spiritual target, it's a, the Bible says it's appointed on a man who wants to die after that's a judgment. We understand all that. But when we get saved, the Bible says it's a new birth. And it also says that new birth, it says what born of the spirit is spirit, that's what is born of the flesh is flesh. Now the flesh is that moral attitude that we're talking about. The spirit that we're born with is that new birth. Okay? That new birth is one that comes only through the cross of Christ. The cross of Calvary. And without that, we're not even saved. If we're trying to do it some other way, then we're reaching it some way that we're not going to be able to receive. It only comes by the cross. And if anybody tells you anything any different than that, you can pray till you're black in the face. How do you want to pray but you're not going to receive anything from God? Because it all comes through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, which the name of the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified on Calvary, and that's where it comes from. We go back to the place where the sacrifice was made so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. Somebody say abundantly means more than I need. More than I need of what? Number one, more than I need of grace. His grace is sufficient. It'll take you through all your problems. Amen. Anytime that you, you go through something and you're not committed on recognizing it as being God's grace until you get there. I don't remember when I told you that it's hard right now, but later on you will remember but look back on this and say, man, God's grace brought me through this. Okay? That's what I mean. You, you can't maybe tell it at that moment, but the time will come when you look back and say, man, God's grace is so sufficient. And you've been singing it and saying it all your life. His grace is sufficient for me, for me. Now, when we're seeing the target, we know what the target is. When the target is so plain in front of your face, we know that the, the target is the cross of Christ. And we know that we're supposed to be an instrument. Now, when it, uh, to be our target is for us to try and be like Jesus. That won't forget my target is what I'm looking for. I'm not like Jesus yet. 
But my target is that I want to be just like Jesus. Jesus was crucified in the flesh. When you were born again, you were born of the Spirit, now you crucified the flesh. Okay, so you want to be like Jesus. You want to walk like Jesus. You want to represent Him wherever you go. Why? Because that's your calling on life. It's a high calling to be like Jesus. We ever sing a song? To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. That's all I have. To be like Him. Who that song? Some of you don't. I sung it when I first got saved. New St. Baptist Church in Cleveland, Tennessee. To be like Jesus. Amen. To be like Jesus. Ed Worthy, that was his favorite song. The guy that taught me a lot about taking body work when I was just younger. But when we look at this, we see that there's, there's a, a Christ-like presence on people that are born of the Spirit. That's the target. Somebody say, a Christ-like Spirit. A Christ-like appearance. A Christ-like spirit will mean that you have a holy appearance upon you when you're presenting yourself in the public. I was preaching in, in college quarter one night, and there was two young girls that I'd known for a pretty good while back when I was doing music. I didn't play her, her dad even played banjo with Ruth that I was with one time. And I was back in this old postal building back there, a guy from Cincinnati or worked in Cincinnati at GE. Come over and started at the church and he left the GE and was working at church right before he stayed up and moved to Tennessee. But he called me up there to preach a revival. And I walked in there and was standing up there preaching in revival and then Renee and Ginger came in. And when they come in, they stood at the back door. And she looked. And she kept looking and she kept looking. And I was preaching just as hard as I could go. Her was moving and already got started. She said, Danny, she said, we could just see the glory of God all around that book that oh, you was preaching. I said, it's what you're supposed to see when a man of God is preaching. When they're talking, you're supposed to see that there's something there that represents the one that died for them. If you don't see that, you don't feel it in their testimony, you don't feel it in their humbleness, chances are they've missed the target a long way. Because, honey, if it wasn't for the cross of Calvary, I would be nothing, absolutely nothing, and neither would you. This stuff right here in this Bible is just stuff unless we don't put the cross to it. If it's not fed in there, it's not a pipe of the blood of the cross of Calvary to your heart. It's meaningless to you. My dad could read that. He had read that Bible four times and you, you read the newspapers. Through and through. Because he'd run out of the same gray books and westerns. He didn't pick the Bible for the reading. He could tell you things in the Bible that, that, that the scholars don't even know about. Wasn't saved. Didn't have the spirit of it in him. He would reject preachers and talk about preachers. All they wanted was money. Until his son came along. Then he started paying attention to me. He said there's something different about that. There is something to what he's doing. My life. And my life in front of my dad. I know the part of the witness that got dad saved. But I tell you what. All of his life he read the Bible. His mom laid him beside her in the bed and was teaching him to read out of that Bible, out of, out of them same great books, before he ever started school, which dad didn't have much school. But he learned to read, and he knew the Word of God. We're talking about the old, the old 1611 King James Bible. Roman numerals, dad didn't even put them there. I still don't know. <laughs> Uh, I just used the, the new king chip. He gave me that 18 that one. I'll just use that one. I don't need that old one. But it had more books in it. It had more books in there too. So dad read all that. He used the Catholic Bible. Dad had read it. And did not believe. He believed that there was life afterwards. But he believed just like the Indians believed. If you put them on the side of a, a, a mountain somewhere on a big old stilt and burn them up, the smoke went up, they went to heaven. If it didn't, they went to hell. But 
when Dad got saved, he still wanted to be cremated. Amen? He still wanted to be cremated. Now, there's only one way, and we're going we're gonna to do this, this calling thing again. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. I'm going to read the scripture here, and then we're going to continue on the way. I want to like say I want to take the time. I'll get ahead of myself. I want to do some teaching here this morning. First Corinthians chapter 1. For Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made in non-effect. Who do you think this is that's telling us this? The Apostle Paul, right? We all know who he is. If he applied, if he applied for, to be the pastor of this church, he wouldn't accept him. <laughs> for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are, are saved, it is what? The power of God. Woo. For us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now, the cross. Where does the power of God come through now? The cross. Amen. It ain't in my works. It ain't in my works. Okay. I do the works because God called me to do the works. I preach the cross because God called me to preach the cross. But the power of God comes through what I preach in the cross, not in what I am in the cross. Amen? The cross works for me the same way that it does for you. If it's not working for, for me, it don't mean it ain't working for you or vice versa. You know? The cross works in my life. If it wasn't, I'd already be hunting something else, wouldn't you? And somebody said, well, Brother Manny, you're, you're always preaching the cross. Why? It's the power of God and the salvation. And to the Jew, it's a stumbling block. But to me, it's the gateway to heaven. I'm going through that gate. I don't know about you. And the reason I keep preaching is that I'm sure you know about it. But... We need to show the other people the power of the gospel of the cross. And we, we do that by the way we walk, the way we talk, the way we live, the way we attend Sunday morning services at church, the way we treat our wives, the way we treat our neighbors. That's how we live the righteousness of God. And it only comes from the cross of Calvary. Somebody say, I am the righteousness of God. Amen. Now, say, I believe that. Because you are the righteousness of God. If God's going to see righteousness on this earth, it has to come through those that are born of the Spirit. You and I, His children. Okay? The born again, baptized believers. I know that thing. Do I ever fail Him? Yes, I do. I do. But I tell you what, when I do, I have an advocate. I have somebody that says, He's praying again. He wants forgiveness. Danny's calling on you again. He's calling me again. He didn't use my name. I know he's ready to do it again. So many times I went and went and went and just, just re realized, oh man, I am safe in the cross. I, I got safety in the cross. And all of a sudden this stuff is piled up in front of me and there's a mountain in front of me that it takes the cross to move it out of the way. But it'd be a lot easier if I just walked it along with it and got it out of the way before I went. Amen? Now, I want to read a little bit more and go into some difference. Okay? And when I say you want to present yourself as Christ, you remember the saying we used to have out here, all little things that said WWJD? Huh? What would Jesus do? Remember, that was a pretty common thing. Everywhere you look at it, WWJD. What would God do? Or what would Jesus do? And what I'm saying is that we present ourselves as Christ on the cross. We wonder, we can't help but wonder what he would do in this circumstance. And I tell you one thing, Jesus wouldn't be up here tooting his own horn in front of you and 
unless you can answer the questions, then you can say, uh, you better. So it's okay for me to tell about Jesus as long as I'm not tooting my own horn. Right? It ain't about me, it's about the cross and what Jesus did on the cross. It took me a long time to figure that out. That I would get along a whole lot better in this life if I put the cross in the right place. And quit trying to pick it up and use it when I needed it. And when I didn't need it, lay it back down and just go and gather back on my own. When I figured that out, I become a whole lot more effective in my ministry. A whole lot more effective in, in seeing hearts melt when I preach the gospel. I've been able to feel the Holy Spirit moving inside me. And me being able to shed tears and humbleness because I felt the power of God coming from the cross of Calvary. That's where your humbleness has to come from. Your heart towards Calvary. Amen. Don't you love Jesus this morning? Let's go deeper into this. Okay. Verse 15. Let us therefore as many as be perfect. Somebody say, well, nobody's perfect. What about to say something else like this for? That really isn't what it's saying right there. What it's saying there, let us therefore as many as be perfect, as be mature. Mature is what that means right there. It makes it perfect. Now there's a reason for that. Be thus minded, and if anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even unto you this to you. Now, the like-mindedness means you're mature you understand what Christ did for you. You understand that the salvation is for all. And when we say that salvation is for all, that means that if that person next door to you or sitting next to you is not saved, it could be your very, very responsibility to win that person to the Lord. Because you understand the power of the ministry of the cross. Well, we're going into Easter today. We're going to be long. We jumped out of the house the floor. But the power of the ministry of the cross, it's up to us. Not to dictate to somebody, but to love somebody and the cross. I can stand here and stomp around in this church and turn benches over and everything else. They didn't want to save nobody. But if I honor them two commandments, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those two. Those two right there. But well, when more people to the Lord than standing and hitting them on the head of the Bible and saying, You're going to hell. You're going to hell. You better put them cigarettes away or you're going to hell. You better stop that and pick up the cross and carry the cross of Calvary. Understand what happened at the cross of Calvary. I know what happened. He died for me. And he said, forgive him, Lord. He don't know what he's doing. You better know what you're doing. But he, if you don't, you don't know whether you're saved or not. You better know what the cross means to you. He died for you so that we can have life and have the world under me. More joy. More peace inside us. I'm not afraid of the devil. Not afraid of the devil. Somebody say, I'm not either. I'm not either. I'm not afraid of the devil. And one of these days, I'll get to see him cast in and hard it up. Won't you? You know who else will be there with him? Hitler. Big Bay Cat. Killed one of them kids of our local home a few years ago. One that said his name, but he was a Victus. He was the captain of his own soul. He could be the captain of his own soul, soul in hell. That's what he chooses to do. Nothing that I can do to stop him. My prayer of faith didn't do nothing to that boy right there. And at that time, I wasn't even sure I wanted to pray for him after he killed one of them kids. I wasn't sure I wanted to. But in Victus, he took that name on. I'm the captain of my own soul. 
I do what I want to do. I had that article in Darlington Church one time. I don't know if it, but I've still got it if you want to like to have it. I, I probably copy it. But in Texas, what did I talk about? 16? Okay. Nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Now, nevertheless, we have already attained. That means our progress is attained. We've learned about the cross. We know why the sacrifice was made. There's things about the cross that we still got questions about. There is. But yet, we still... Our progress through what we've heard about the cross has brought us to this point. Some of you have come farther than others. But the only reason that is is because your, your concern for the cross and what happens with the cross and what the cross will do for you is not as important to you as maybe as it is to some others that seek it out a little bit deeper. My message is the same. Okay? It's the same. Every time I, I bring a message forward, in this church, I'm seeking God for what I'm going to say. That's why some mornings I can get real happy and have a good time doing it. Some mornings I can settle down and teach a while. But it's still the same outcome. My job is to feed the flock of God. It's not to go on with a bunch of caterwauling and that people will get anything out of it. If I could preach the cross and get you to understand it, I have accomplished a whole boat of the problems in your life. Uh, you're taking that to apply to your heart because the cross will move obstacles out of your life that you never had no idea that it could do. If you've got things in your, your, your mind that you hate your brother for, the cross will move it out. If you've got things in your, your system that's holding you up to keep you from doing the, Lord, the, the Lord's work, the cross will move those things out. And once those things start getting moved, getting moved out, you'll see things start to happen in your life where that actually people in your family will be turning to Christ because of what they see in you. Well, I don't see how I can make any difference. It will. It will. There ain't nobody in this world that's above good testimony. And sooner or later, you might be just the one that makes that testimony to a daughter-in-law or a son-in-law or a grandson or, 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 or somebody that you want to give that testimony that they finally pick up on what the cross means and they receive eternal life through the cross of Calvary. I know for a fact there's not a one of you in this building that are saved and wouldn't love so much this next week to win somebody to Christ. You can't do it if you're not carrying the cross. Let's go to Luke. What is it? Luke, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, Luke chapter 9. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save 
it. Although you may lose your life because you're doing the work of the cross, you're still going to save your own life. Somebody said, how can that be? Because you're going to save your life for a better country. You're going to save your life for a better, a better beginning, a new beginning. Remember what I told you a few months ago about how that Jesus rose on the first day of the week, which is the eighth day, means a new beginning. That's why it's always the first day. You have seven days in a week, then you have the first day, a new beginning. It's a new week. It's always a new beginning. So let's get deeper here now. And verse 17, rather be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. Now, here we go. There is imitators we call them. Right? And when, you, when you're walking, there's people that are actually walk, walking and watching you. And they're going to imitate the things that you do because they think that this is the Christian way to do it. And all the time, may not be. You may be following somebody that's not even saved. It's just a do-gooder that thinks that this, will good, this is good enough to get me to heaven. Without the cross, it ain't good enough to get you nowhere. Amen? All the good works you can do without the cross, it's not going to get you nowhere. It takes a new birth. So when we, we go to looking at this and we see how that they, they imitate and they try to show it would, it, it'll even show that it looks like Christ. It'll show that there's a likeness of the cross and there's a likeness of the witness, the witness of Christ. But it doesn't mean that it is a witness of Christ. You see, the devil is very good with the counterfeit. I can show you through the Bible, Jeroboam and all of them, whether they built temples and everything. And they were a mockery to God. They looked like everything that they needed to worship God because it resembled the house of God. A lot of things in the church today that just resembles God's house. But it's not used as God's house. You hear me? Aren't you glad that you're not that way? I would be. Yeah. I would be glad if I wasn't that way. I don't always, I don't always look like the temple of God, the honey I'm trying to look like. And when he gets down to the river meets the road, I'm the first woman to stand toe to toe with the devil and say, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. Take my life. You can kill me here. I don't want to. No matter me. I'm leaving here shouting too. So I'm, I'm just about fed up in this place anyhow. Okay. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk as ye have us for an example. The Apostle Paul said, I'll be your example. Oh, oh. Now we do this. See, if you're following the cross and you're carrying your cross, you're saying, watch me. I will be your example. I'll be what you the example that you can follow. I may not be right all the time, but watch me. You'll see me. I'm doing my work. I'm doing my, I'm trying to please God. I'm carrying the cross. I'm talking to the people. I'm trying to witness. I'm trying to be something for the Lord that can bring eternal life into somebody else's, into somebody else's heart. Look at it. Some people won't even tell nobody that they're a Christian because they don't want to have to live different around them. I told him, put the guy down the car company one day, he said, you're a preacher, right? And I said, yeah. He said, well, you didn't tell us that. I don't have to. I said, I don't have to. He said, well, we know there's something different about you. I said, see, I don't have to. He said, if I'd have told him, I said, if I'd have come in here and told you, told you I was a preacher, I said, the first thing you did not grab a hold of your pocket. Turn around, got a hold of your bill phone and said, ah, oh, oh, honey. Get him out of here. I said, I didn't do that. I'm not after you, buddy. I'm after your heart. I'm after your heart. That guy right there, I've known him for quite a while. For 20 years, I've been tired of him. He's 
to preach me great, and I preach to do, treat him great. I don't know, he may be a good Catholic. He won't ever tell me his religious preference. But I tell you what, he sure has to do his act up all the time. Since I started going around him, I say that. And I didn't, I didn't make him do it. You see, I'm not one that wants to make you change the way that you talk and act and everything because I walk in the room. I'll tell you one thing. Back when I first got back into the ministry and everything to the Lord, if I walked into the pit to the, the, the bar down there in Ross, they thought Christ walked in. Because they saw me coming in and they would say, look out, here he comes. Here he comes. It's the power of the gospel, not me. Now, verse 18, for many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. If you're trying to carry a cross and show it to the devil, you're in the wrong business. You need to get saved. Amen. Read that again. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are, the, they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who mind their earthly things, and they pervert the gospel for personal gain. They will change the gospel of the cross for perfect gain. They will lie to you for a payday. And we get ourselves into a shape that we start looking out for somebody doing that and we might be doing it our own selves. Somebody says, well, what do you mean by that? Well, if you didn't, if you don't pay your tithes, you're a thief. God said it, not me. You're a thief. If you tell a lie, you lie. Makes you a liar. Well, I'm not I'm repenting for it. Don't matter. You still lie. You still lie. Amen. You still that. The only thing that saves you is you're saved by the grace of God. That's it. You're not saved any other way. You can stop lying all you want to and the day will save you. It helps. If you lie on your taxes, you just stole from the government. And you're liar. If you lie for insurance money, uh-oh, you're a liar. Hear me? Well, I'd like to give us up if you give the money back. I got total disability, but if you didn't lie about it, that's fine. But if you did, I don't think I'd want to dial that money to bank. We go, you're a liar. Somebody said, well, I didn't know it was that, that serious. With God, it's serious. It is serious. Listen to me. It's serious with God. A whole lot more serious with God than it is with me. It's serious with God. He don't like it when we do things like that. It's angry. Somebody said, if you may not live for salvation, sometimes you'll be like Joe and Joe and you'll, you'll wish you, you, you could die. Because some of the things that come upon you because of your disobedience to God. We don't understand that we, we not only pay for the deeds that's done in our life, we have to pay for the, the idle words to where we didn't say something to somebody else. It's called oppression. When you're oppressed and you're afraid to say something to somebody that's lost, that's something that we, we pay for in our life. People don't realize it. <coughs> but nobody is perfect before God unless they are forgiven. That's the only way. When I get up in the morning and my feet hits the floor, that's when I cease to be perfect. I pray before I get up, Lord, forgive me. I paid last, last night before I went to sleep, forgive me of any 
people thoughts or anything that I did during the day. If I hurt anybody or let me know who it was, I'm sure if I can fix it. Lord, forgive me when I failed you last night. I go to sleep forgiven. When I get up and I hit the floor, the perfection is gone now. That first step, especially if the cats are under the bed and I step on his tail and I get one of them, perfection is gone. You lose track of where you're at. You lose track of what you're doing. You drive down the highway and somebody pulls out right in front of you, man, that can get you in a hurry. There's all kinds of things that, that we do that's just absolutely not pleasing to God. Now, I'm, I'm, Put a long way around to say this. But thanks to the cross of Calvary, none of you have to go to bed tonight with your head down, feeling disgraceful because you have sinned, even though you know that you have. The only reason you would have to go to bed with your head down would be if you went to bed and with all your heart for your brother and your sister. Because then, you're putting them in a category that's lower than what we are. We're doing it. And when we do that, God lifts them up. You listen to me? None of you, there's not a one of you in this building that's under me. I can hear that by now. None of you. We're all the same. I'm saved by grace just like you are. We are all the same. The cross of Calvary is what? Through the blood was shed for my salvation, the same as yours. When I lay down at night, I'm going to lay down and forgive it for anything I might have done during the day that wasn't pleasing to God. I hope you do the same thing. Because there's going to come a time in this life when we will give an account. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, again I come to you this morning.